This is a full start to finish MIG welding tutorial covering everything from the things that you'll need, how to get set up, how to run good welds. And because there's so much information in here, I've timestamped the video. Feel free to skip around to find the parts that are gonna be most helpful for you. And if you'd like me to work through the learning process with you step by step, I've put a link to my affordable online courses down in the description. Let's go ahead and get started by talking about how the process works. So we're talking about gas metal arc welding. It's often called MIG welding, and it works by forming an electrical arc between a metal wire electrode and the parts that you are welding to locally heat it to a very high temperature. This melts the base metal, allowing it to join together. And the wire, which is usually a similar material, is fed out of the MIG gun by an electric motor and pushed into the weld puddle to reinforce the weld. Gas flows out of the nozzle to protect the molten metal from contamination by the air, and the gas is also important for the arc to work correctly. Now there are actually about half a dozen different variations of this process. We're gonna be looking at the most common one here. Others might weld different materials or use different gases to get a slightly different result. Let's talk quickly about the things that you're gonna need. Uh, of course, you'll need a welding machine, but there are a few other things that you'll find really useful. First of all, for safety, You'll need a welding helmet. Auto darkening helmets are nice and they usually allow you to adjust the shade. I normally run from a shade 10 to a 12. Some nice thick welding gloves keep my hands from getting burned and a welding jacket offers some additional protection. I like these cotton style jackets. You'll need solid welding wire. The most common type is ER70S-6. Now MIG wire comes in a bunch of different diameters, different sizes. I usually run 0.030 or 30 thousandths of an inch diameter. This is good clear from sheet metal thicknesses up to right around a quarter of an inch thick. And so it works well for me. There are other sizes, larger, smaller, depending on what you're doing. Uh, 0.035 or 35 thousandths is another common size if you're kind of on the thicker end of that same range that I was talking about. You'll need a cylinder of shielding gas, usually either 75% argon and 25% CO2 or straight CO2. Now there are several other gases that are used for different variations of the process or different materials, but those are less common for regular garage or shop fabrication work. Big welding pliers are really handy. I use them all the time. They can be used to cut wire, remove nozzles and contact tips, and they can also clean spatter out of the nozzle. Now I'll show you how to set up your machine. I've completely disconnected one of my machines just like it was when it came out of the box. Some things on your machine might be slightly different, but the general idea should be the same. The first thing I'll do is install my MIG gun. The big connector on the end has a hole for for the wire to enter. Now inside this cable, there's a liner that's similar to a cable for brakes on a bicycle. And the wire feeds through this and it can wear out uh, over time, but usually I'm able to run several spools of wire through a machine before I have to replace that liner. The large metal surface handles the electrical connection and there are holes between these O-rings for the gas to flow through. I'll slide this into the machine and secure it with the screw. On this style of gun, there's also a plug for the trigger switch, which will plug into the machine. Another common style of connector looks like this and handles all of the electrical connections and the gas flow. It just plugs in and it's secured with the hand nut. On most machines, you'll need to select the right polarity or whether the gun is connected to positive or negative by connecting the gun to the positive terminal and the work clamp to the negative terminal. Now this polarity is called DC electropositive because the electrode or the wire is connected to the positive terminal. If you are gonna run self-shielded flux core wire without any gas uh, in the future, you'll usually need to switch those terminals and connect the electrode to the negative side. Next, we need to set up the right drive roll. There are little grooves on these rollers that push the wire through and you need to be using the right size groove for your wire. They are generally labeled in a way that shows the size it is installed for on the side of the roll. On this machine, there are multiple positions for different sizes of wire. Now you might notice on uh, some rollers that uh, you might have a groove with little knurls or little dents all the way around the uh, outside. That's generally used for flux cord wire, for solid wire like we're using today you'll usually have smooth V-shaped grooves. The wire can now be installed. If you're using a small two pound spool of wire, you often need to remove an adapter to install the spool. On larger spools, the fastener for the adapter usually controls the tension of the wire. Now it's best if you don't crank the adapter down too tight. It's really just there to keep the spool from uh, spinning freely. There's a pin on most adapters that I line to the top so it's easy to engage with the hole in the spool. Make sure to keep a grip on the wire so that it doesn't unspool and feed the wire into the wire guide over the drive roll and into the gun liner secondary guide. Clamp down the idler and the wire is ready to feed. To allow the wire to feed out of the gun, remove the nozzle and contact tip. 
Now the contact tip up here in the end of the gun, that makes the electrical connection between the machine and the actual wire electrode. And they come in different sizes, so now's a good time to check and make sure you're using the right size. It's usually stamped right in the side. With the machine on, pull the lead out straight and press the trigger. When the wire feeds out of the end, thread on the contact tip, reinstall the nozzle, and trim the wire. Now we're ready to connect the shielding gas. Crack the cylinder valve open and close it quickly just to blow out any dirt. Install the regulator to the cylinder and to the machine, and then turn the gas flow rate up to 25 to 30 cubic feet per hour, which is 13 to 15 liters per minute. The last thing for setup is connecting our work clamp. Now our work clamp is connected to that negative terminal, and while it's best to clamp the uh, clip right onto your work, I usually just hook it to my welding table, and that works good enough for me. Now let's go over the settings on your machine. Now most machines have the same two common settings, voltage and wire feed speed. You might have other settings like inductance. Uh, if you do have inductance, just turn it up a little bit over half. That should be good enough, but it's not as big of an impact as these main two settings we're gonna talk about. This machine has automatic settings, which is a great feature that I use a lot, but I'm going to turn it off in the interest of learning. Now, inside the cover of most machines, you'll find a chart which gives some settings for voltage and wire feed speed based on wire size and the gas you're using. For one eighth of an inch thick material, this machine recommends 18 volts and 310 inches per minute. Now my experience has been that the recommended settings on most machines are good enough. Um, if you are running in the vertical or overhead positions, sometimes you need a little bit lower setting. So you can just use the settings for one or two material thicknesses lower on the chart. And that works out pretty well a lot of the time, but let's dig into some of the fundamentals behind these settings and how it actually works. So you'll be able to, you know, fine tune things as you gain more experience. So you might intuitively think that the voltage just controls how much heat energy is going into your weld and the wire feed speed just controls how much material is being added. It makes sense, right? That's what I thought when I first started, but that's actually not the case. Your wire speed actually affects the amperage of your weld, or it's the primary variable to control how much heat goes into your material. For that reason, if you need more heat, turn up your wire feed speed. That's why you'll see on charts, the wire feed speed changes and goes up dramatically as you go thicker in through the material. So if the wire feed speed controls both the amount of heat energy that's going in and the amount of wire that's added, what do we need the voltage for at all? Well, it has to do with the way that the process operates. And this particular variation of the process is called short circuit MIG welding. Now in short circuit MIG welding, the wire feeds out of the gun, contacts your work, and then an arc starts and it burns back the wire, then it goes out, the wire feeds in, and this repeats over and over again many times per second. Your voltage has to be tuned in for that to happen in the right way. Let's dig into this a little bit more by running an experiment. I'm gonna leave the wire feed speed at the recommended 310 inches per minute, but then I'm going to run weld beads at a number of different voltages. So I've turned the voltage clear down to 14 volts, and notice how the wire stubs out. It's hard to keep an arc going. The arc definitely isn't running the way it needs to. 16 volts, it's running better, but it's still pretty sputtery. At 18 volts, it's running pretty good. This was the recommended voltage. Uh, it works pretty well. At 20 volts, still not bad, but the arc is starting to burn back and I'm seeing a little more spatter flying out of the weld. And turned up to 22 volts, it's burning back some more and there's even more spatter. So the sweet spot is somewhere there in the middle. I'd say between that 18 and 19 volts, would give you a really good weld. Let's take a look at the welds that came out of this experiment. Notice how the beads become more flat as the voltage increases. You'll generally see this because the increased voltage not only makes the arc run properly, but it does increase the overall heat energy that's going into that weld, as well as the effective length of the arc, and that longer arc spreads things out a bit too. So as you get started, I'd recommend just starting with the recommended settings on your machine. That's usually good enough until you get a little bit of experience with technique, but keep these principles in mind as you get a little more experience and dial things in. And the way that I like to do it, and what I'd recommend, especially if you're just getting started, is to run an experiment, just change one thing at a time, 
and run welds over and over again and really get that hands-on understanding of what effect turning each of the knobs has. Now let's talk about welding technique. This is the most important section of the whole video. I've worked with a lot of people who have struggled with settings and asked for help with that. And more often than not, it turns out to be a technique problem rather than an issue with the machine. That's why we spend so much time in my online courses going through and practicing each element of welding technique to really drill it in. So the first thing that you need to pay attention to is your contact tip to work distance, the distance from your contact tip to your work. It's often called stick out because that's how far the wire sticks out of the gun. This needs to be right around a half inch or a little bit less even for short circuit MIG welding. Most beginners tend to be a little bit far away. The second thing is your gun angle. There's two different components to gun angle. One is called your work angle. This is the direction perpendicular to the direction of travel. On a flat plate, you'd be 90 degrees right in and out of the plate. Or if you're welding a T-joint down in a corner, then you'd be 45 degrees in and out of that corner there. When you're doing that type of a weld, it's called a fillet weld, by the way. The other component is travel angle, which is in the direction of travel. Usually an angle of 10 to 15 degrees in either direction works just fine. A drag angle can provide slightly more penetration, though I tend to use a push angle, which is more comfortable for me and consistent with the technique needed on other materials. A common problem that people have is maintaining their stick out and angle along the length of a joint. This is because there seems to be a natural tendency to twist your wrist in order to travel. This throws off the angle and leaves you finishing your weld with a long stick out, which will affect the function of the arc. Now you might not even notice that this is happening. So take a look at your wire as you finish and maybe you're moving farther away if it's long, but if you're like most people I've taught, you tend to use your wrist to curve right there. So keep an eye out for that. It'll make a difference in your weld. The last thing to get right is your movement. There are two aspects to movement. First is your travel speed, how fast you move along the joint. Now travel speed generally controls the size of the weld. If you travel slower, you're gonna get a larger weld. If you travel faster, a smaller one. There are limits to that though. If you're welding on really thin material and you go too slow, you're just gonna blow holes right through it. And if you're welding on thicker material and you go too fast, what'll happen is you'll melt out more space than you're actually able to fill in and you end up with a little recessed spot that's called undercut. Another aspect to movement is gun manipulation. There's been a lot of chatter over the years on manipulation of the gun, whether it's loops, a weave, or one of the other bajillion shapes people have come up with. The reality is that it's usually not necessary to manipulate the gun at all. And if you do, it's often best to keep it relatively small. Now in some situations, especially on vertical welds, uh, running a bit of manipulation or a little bit of a weave can be pretty helpful just to keep your weld from crowning up too much. It keeps it a little bit flatter. And also uh, a little bit of manipulation can be helpful just to pace yourself as you move along. But don't think that you need to get carried away with that or that's gonna be the key to success because that hasn't been my experience. Watch as I run this weld without any manipulation at all. I'm just maintaining that stick out, work and travel angles, and moving along as smoothly as I can, just using the recommended settings on the machine, and it's coming out pretty nicely. Now last of all, let's talk about body positioning. Body positioning and comfort are pretty important to getting a good weld because that's what allows you to really focus in and maintain your welding technique. And so it's best if you're able to use your other hand to prop. When I first started welding school, I thought, you know what, I'm gonna do everything freehand, then I'll just be awesome at that. And I soon learned that there's no need to make life harder than it needs to be. Um, though you do sometimes have to work freehand and you just do what you have to do. But whenever you don't, it's best to use your other hand to prop up and either slide along, which is ideal, or if you can't, just collapse your hand down uh, to be able to prop on something, kind of triangulate and get comfortable. So take a minute to get comfortable before you run every weld. It'll really make a big difference in how your welds turn out. Well, that's everything you need to know to go from the beginning, clear up to laying down beads that you're proud of. I've linked in the description some other videos that you might find really helpful as you're learning to MIG weld, as well as my online course. I've been so excited to receive feedback and all the things that people are learning taking these courses. You know, if it saves you a couple hours of time or even one piece of material, it will have already paid for itself. So check that out if you're interested. And until next time, weld safe, and we'll see you then.